everyone and welcome back to Behind the Wheel, made possible by Mode Push and Racing Force Esports. And today, I interviewed IndyCar driver Stingray Rob. I won't take up too much time with the intro, so here it is. I hope you enjoy the episode. Well, I can't really believe I'm saying this, and you don't, you're not reading the title wrong. Stingray Rob, welcome to the show. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, and yourself? I'm good, thank you very much. Um, well, we're just over halfway through your first ever IndyCar season. Uh, are you getting used to the IndyCar stuff now, or is it all still a little bit new? It's all still a little bit new. I think that there's so many nuances and details that go into racing in the IndyCar series. I mean, we're, we're dealing with three different kinds of racetracks, and none of them are alike. You know, you're going from road to street to super speedways to short ovals. And so for myself, I think that the biggest challenges have been learning the tracks that I don't have experience on and uh, relearning the tracks I do have experience on in a new car, new tire compound, new team, all the things that uh, can play into how you drive. And um, obviously you've made a, a big step up from, I believe, Indy, Indy Lights at that time. It's now Indy Next. Um, how has that transition been from Indy Lights to now full out in Indy car? It's been pretty good. You know, I think that initially I was uh, expecting a bit more of a transition to feel what the car was capable of doing. But um, to be honest, they, they do a good job of preparing you in the in the latter series as you come up through the ranks. It's obviously a bigger, faster car. So you're done with more weight, more downforce, more horsepower, more grip. Um, and all those things can affect how you drive the car. And the driving styles are quite different from Indy Next to Indy Car. Um, Indy Next Car at least when I was driving, because it was on a different tire compound than the Firestones, um, they would have a more oversteer, a more loose driving style that was required. And so you'd be hanging out over the ragged edge uh, every time you got in the car. And the, the Indy car is a bit different just because that window is much smaller, and it actually tends to be more understeer. And I think that that's just the way that the, the car is set up and the way that the weight is balanced in the car. Um, it seems like that with the with a larger wheelbase and all that, it makes it less likely to rotate. And so you have to do a different driving style and that also requires a different setup, a different uh, feeling that the car will give you when it's going fast. Are there more similarities uh, with Indy Next than people think, or are they kind of just like completely different cars? I think that there are probably more similarities than people think. I mean, you're using the same tools in the cockpit other than a weight jack around super speedways or ovals. Um, you know, for myself, I think that the biggest change has been learning the strategy side, you know, the, the pit stops, the how to handle all of that, and the chaos of a longer race distance. You're no longer doing sort of a sprint race where it's 45 minutes long. We're doing three hour events in the car. And so that means multiple stops, uh, multiple stints in the car. And so it kind of how you pace yourself in the racing conditions, it, it changes, you know, in, in Indy next, it's flat out and you drive as hard as you can for as long as you can. And that's what's going to be uh, to keep the success there. But in IndyCar, you kind of have to figure out the game a little bit and go with the different scenarios. And, okay, if I play my cards this way, I can do this later on. If I play them now, I'm going to have to do this later on. And so there's a lot of different dynamics that go on behind the scenes more so than they do on the track. And um, how has that transition, again, been with uh, your fitness and stuff like that? Because like you just said, now you're doing three-hour races. I think Detroit was 100-something, I think 100 laps. So yeah, how has that affected like your training and stuff like that to go from Indy Next to IndyCar? It is a big step up. And at the beginning of the year, my neck was sore after every event. You know, I felt like my my hands were sore, my forearms were sore, my biceps, my shoulders, my neck, everything was just more more uh, out of shape, I guess you could say. Um, but you know, I, I did a lot of training during the off season to try and be prepared to do this. And I think that Pit Fit Training is the gym that I go to, and they do a good job of understanding where that baseline needs to be and so it was kind of cool to see guys like scott dixon or alexander rossi come in do their workouts and I, that's the standard that i have to meet and so i think that at the beginning of the year i kind of knew what i was getting myself into i wasn't taken by surprise by any means of the physicality of driving the car um but it definitely is a step up from indy next like i said because it's no longer a sprint race you kind of have to pace yourself and manage those those physical traits that lead to brain fade or whatever else might happen during a race. And so kind of planning out when you take a sip of water in the car, something as simple as that can make a difference. Hmm. And um, actually uh, a little bit 
where it, before your first ever race in IndyCar, obviously you've had preseason testing and stuff like that. Um, how were your nerves going into your first race? Were you ready or were you still like nervous and <laughs> yeah? It's kind of funny going into St. Pete. Um, I wasn't nervous at all for some reason. I think it was because I didn't have an expectation. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And then, you know, it goes through turn three and there's a stack up of cars and we're having to avoid a crash. But um, I think that since then my nerves have increased because I know what I'm getting myself into. And I think Simon Pagino said it at the 500. It's like, it never gets easier. Like it never becomes more calm or less chaotic or, or less nerve wracking. You just deal with it better. You know, I think that it's just a, a tolerance of being uncomfortable. And so I think that that's kind of like what I'm learning is that um, I'm not, I wasn't nervous at the start, but I'm kind of learning like the the importance of being nervous in the sense that it makes you aware. It makes you realize what you're getting yourself into. And it also is a good sign that you're prepared in the sense of you, you realize that what is about to happen. You know, you have that expectation and you're able to be prepared for it more. Mm. And um, again, like, did those preseason obviously like doing preseason testing will help but did it not wasn't as like useful as you thought it was going to be or was it probably more useful i wish that we had more you know gone are the days that you're in the car 40 days before the race weekend even starts um you know i think that as a rookie driver it's hard to go into a racing series without that experience when you're dealing with guys that have been racing indy car as long as you've been driving anything you know before i was in go-karts there were guys that were winning races in indycar that i'm still racing with today and so for myself i think that um the preseason testing did help but i wish we had more of it i wish that we had you know triple or quadruple the amount of days that we we have now and i know a lot of teams have like simulators uh for uh their teams are you using the simulator a lot or are you more of a not simulator guy basically <laughs> um yeah so we're pretty lucky i drive for a honda power team and so we have the hpd simulator that we're able to go to and kind of learn the tracks on and uh to do a lot of data compare and just driver development inside of a space where there's uh, less consequences and also we can learn different setups in the car you know honda does a lot of research and development outside of what the teams give them and so it's kind of cool to see what they're able to kind of teach us as a team and so as far as that goes that's been really beneficial i've only gotten to do it a couple of times so far and uh, I'll have another chance to do that later this week to get prepared for Road America. But I think that for myself, the simulators, they're they are great for a basic learning tool. But at some point, that last 2 or 3% that you're looking for, it doesn't come until you're at the racetrack. And so you can be really, really good on the simulator and show up at the track and maybe not have it all together. And so when you're dealing in IndyCar, where the field is full of super talented, well-deserving drivers, that last one or two percent could be the difference between 15th to first you know there's not a lot of room for error in this series and so if you got to figure it out um, ahead of time it helps um, but i think the simulator is good to establish a baseline and understand the rhythm of tracks etc how actually realistic are those uh simulators are they basically like a it feels exactly like you're in the car with like steering and stuff like that obviously i know g-forces aren't are probably not in there but like the feeling of the car is that like basically almost exactly like it yeah, they, they have really good feedback, and I think that they work hard on that. You know, I think the most important thing is the pedal feedback. Braking is some of the, the hardest things to simulate because you're dealing with the G-forces of your body carrying your weight into the brake pedal. And so I think a lot of simulators don't have that that factor, and Honda has done a good job of kind of simulating that, and they can change it driver to driver. And so if I feel like I need something different compared to what David has, my teammate, um, they can make that adjustment. And so that's, that's kind of the cool thing is just the – unlimited adjustability which is not necessarily the best thing in the world because you don't always need what's the most comfortable you need what's the most accurate and so um accuracy of the simulators they are pretty good they do a good job of laser scanning the tracks and understanding where the bumps are um, understanding where the walls are and getting a good idea of what that looks like ahead of time um, but when it comes down to that last you know little bit of okay what's the traction going to be like what's the braking going to be like what's the grip level going to be like they can only get you as close as they think that it's going to be, you know, they don't ever really know. And so uh, that's something that changes on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I could go to road America this week and test and then go to the race uh, a week from now. 
and it's going to be a second faster maybe or two seconds faster who knows and so that's just something that you have to deal with in the moment those variables are always changing and adapting and so a simulator is great um for accuracy with constant conditions mm -hmm. but if those conditions change it's hard to simulate actually i want to talk about um your teammate uh david david Mal malukas is that, am i pronouncing that right hopefully i am yep um how has your relationship been with him are you guys kind of during a race weekend uh trading like advice for like how to take this corner or is it you know just you do me you, your thing i'll do my thing yeah you know teammates are kind of a funny thing in motorsports because unlike other championships or sporting events in the world your teammate is also your biggest competition as much as they are your biggest help and so for myself and david um, it's been actually pretty cool to see because he was a rookie last year. He's been in the same position that I'm in recently. And so his knowledge is very applicable to what I'm doing, but he's also kind of fighting his own battles. Um, you know, I think that he expected to be further up in the series than he is so far this year. And same thing with me, you know, I think that we're both in a similar position that we're, we're not meeting the expectations that we set for ourselves. Um, so we are kind of trying to help each other along. We're trying to push the team together, but at the same time, we're, we're always doing this little, uh, compare of like, okay. He did this, so I'm going to do this, and I did this, so I'm going to do this. And then, you know, it just push each other back and forth. And so you always want to beat your teammate because they're your best standard. Um, and so for myself, I think it's been a really good relationship with David. You know, we've had some incidents together, and um, he's been encouraging and forgiving and um, insightful. And that's something that I don't think that a lot of drivers may, um, you know, it's, it's something that I, I think that a lot of drivers take for granted is to be someone that can actually raise the, the level of the drivers around you, and it helps the whole team. And um, actually, because uh, I know in other motorsports, like a lot of these guys kind of race each other through like uh, when they were kids, like in carts and stuff like that. Has anyone been there, there for you where you're like, oh, I remember you from like, because uh, I know you're in like Rotax Max or something like that. I remember you from that series or something yeah. like that. Has anyone been there? Yeah, David was one of those guys. You know, we grew up go-karting together from the time I think that we were eight or nine years old. We were in the same series. Uh, come up to the rings and we kind of split off and came back. But um, so David was one. Uh, I definitely remember being at the track with Pato Award, Kyle Kirkwood, Colton Herta, um, Renus VK, Oliver Askew was another guy that came up through the rings with. I remember seeing uh, Santino Ferrucci. There was, I think, the 2012 Rotax Nationals in South Bend, Indiana, and it poured rain the whole weekend. And uh, he just swept the, the whole race weekend through the rain. Um, wiped the floor with everyone else that was out on the racetrack that like, dominated and so there's definitely guys in the series now that i i remember coming up to the karting ranks together um it's kind of cool to see you know it's kind of a younger class of drivers that moving up to the ranks at the same speed and uh now we're here in car. yeah and that's really like cool. uh, that'd be cool, cool to see like oh yeah i remember you from like when i was like nine or something like that yeah um yeah. but yeah uh obviously a few weeks ago um or last last i don't yeah last week was the indy 500 i believe um how was the preparation for that you know i had some good advice going into the month of may then it's not the month of may it's the year of may and that just goes to show you like how long that month actually feels and there's so much preparation time um, i mean you're spending almost every day at the track and even when you're not on track driving uh, there's media events that are just all the time around him. I mean, I, I remember there was a, two days in a row in between qualifying weekend and race weekend where I'd get up at 7 in the morning for my first interview at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and I would get done doing those media events at about 8.45 that night. And so it's like 12-hour shifts of just media, constant, constant media, um, which is a lot for a rookie driver that didn't know what I was getting myself into there. But it was really kind of cool to see um, not only the driver preparation that goes into it, but also the the fan preparation. You know, Indianapolis is called the racing capital of the world for a reason. And I think it's because of the culture that's around it. And so it was really cool to see like everyone that would have porch parties and they would be celebrating the Indy 500 before the Indy 500 was even started. You know, you'd see uh, houses with a checkered flag on the front porch with the Indianapolis logo on it. And also with the driver, their, their favorite driver, they were supporting for the race weekend staked in their ground in the front yard. So, um, you know, I think that being a fan first was a really cool experience because I can kind of appreciate both sides now. And having seen the 500 from that perspective, it gave me a new, new appreciation for it now that I'm a driver in the 500. Well, actually, I want to talk about um, the media as well, because 
what's kind of been the has the media side of like driving has that been the biggest kind of change now being in indycar is that has that been the biggest change or something else yeah i think so i think the popularity um you know it's kind of funny i think i had over 250 people follow me in one day during that that span you know the two weeks leading up to the 500 and like it's crazy because i'm just a kid from idaho and you know like there's seven to eight thousand people in my hometown i graduated with a class of less than 100 and so like i don't even know that many people and so to have that many people just follow like i had my graduating class follow me in one day essentially you know double that and so for myself it's crazy to see the sort of impact um that it's had on my world just being exposed in the media coverage um you know i'll go out to dinner here in indianapolis people recognize me come up say hello take a picture um and so it's just kind of interesting to see that perspective of like oh wow okay it's like this is actually a big deal you know we're in indycar now i'm i'm on television and so i think that um yeah that probably has been the biggest impact so far this season and like like you just said uh like you you grew up in a small town uh how did you get your love for motorsport in like a very small uh small town basically yeah so since you didn't ask the question i appreciate you not asking but it's not very often that i don't get asked but my name is kind of where it started yeah and so stingray is actually from the stingray corvette my parents were big corvette fans and so they passed their passion to me along through my name and uh that kind of tells a story of you know i grew up at corvette club meetings i actually took my first steps at a corvette club meeting and uh would go to the drag races and autocross events with them and so i grew up kind of spending time around these cool old loud fast cars and uh you know i think when i was around the age of three i really started to realize what i wanted to do i wanted to be a race car driver and so it's kind of crazy to say like at three years old that's what i wanted to be but um you know i think every kid goes through like a stage of wanting to be something and for me that was the first stage and then i just stayed with it and so when i was around four years old uh i was actually watching a nitro circus video with travis pastrana who's a multi motorsport athlete he's very good at everything he does it seems like um but he jumped a go-kart into a foam pit and when i saw that as a four-year-old i said oh that's what i want to do and so i asked my parents for a go-kart and a foam pit and for my fifth birthday got a go-kart but no foam pit and then we began racing and so growing up in idaho a small town um that's kind of like how i got started it's kind of like the grassroots um people are car people doesn't matter where you go you're going to find someone that has that sort of passion and um you know it kind of started with my parents spending time at those events and i would just sit in the back seat of my mom or my dad's car and drive along with them get to experience it, and get to smell the burning rubber and the gasoline and uh just kind of the cool sights and sounds that go along with everything and did you basically immediately go into like cart racing on like a track or did you ever like build kind of a circuit maybe in like your backyard or something like that yeah so when i initially got my go-kart my my fifth birthday i'm born in september and so um the racing season ends typically around that time and so i drove around in our driveway pretty much from september until the beginning of the next racing season so i was about five and a half before i actually actually really went to a racetrack um, and so we ended up doing that and there was just a local quarter mile, uh, go-kart track that was fairly close to our house. Um, and so I did that for a little while and then we ended up traveling the world a little bit. Um, by the time I was nine, I'd already been to Canada and Italy. And by the time I was, um, 14, I'd been to Spain, Portugal, England, France, Italy, Belgium, all for the sake of racing go-karts. And so I guess the, the, the start of it was just that, you know, setting up a cone in the driveway and hit the apex here and then go around here and do this. So. It was a it was a pretty cool thing to be able to experience all of the all of the different things that go into starting out. Yeah, and uh, I know once you started to get into um, like uh, full on like circuit uh, karting, I know you found like a lot of uh, a lot of success. But how was that transition from karts to I, I believe is the Skip Barber series? I think. Yeah. How was yeah. that transition? Yeah, so I think that, you know, for myself, uh, when I was in karting, we were gone 42 weekends a year. And that's a lot for a kid that's still playing sports and still going to school. And I was homeschooled until sixth grade, and then I started going to public school in seventh grade. And so I kind of caught the ca- tail end of my karting career uh, in public school. And that was a long, a long time on the road um, in the seat. And I think part of that was because when I was younger, my, my parents had read a book, and uh, I actually read it with them. 
it was called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and it talks about the 10,000 hour rule. And essentially what it is is that you have to spend 10,000 hours doing whatever it is that you want to be great at in order to become great at it, um, whether it be you know making a podcast, driving a race car, uh, hitting a baseball. You got to spend 10,000 hours of working and getting better and improving um, and gaining that experience in order to hit that sort of light switch moment of like, okay, I got this. I understand this. I can do this and I'm, I'm going to be the best at it. And so I got to that, that stage pretty early on in go-karts. Um, and then that transition from, from carts to cars was a bit different because in cars, um, first off, my parents, they ran out of funding when I was in go-karts. They, they weren't able to pay my way anymore. And so we had a limited car schedule of what I was able to do. And so my seat time decreased a lot. Um, but I was able to do the Skip Barber series and get the carts to car shootout so I could run the winter series in that. Um, and that was kind of my introduction. But I also wanted to make sure that open wheel is what I wanted to stay with. And so during 2016, I was racing carts for CRG factory team in Europe in the KZ category. And I was also doing Skip Barber. I did a little bit of NASCAR and I did a little bit of dirt modified. Um, and I also did the Bondurant driving school with a sports car. And so for myself, I wanted to try it all and make sure that whatever it was that I settled on, um, you know, racing is not just a straight ladder to the top. It's more like shattered glass. And there's so many different championships that you can go run in at the top level that um, I wanted to be efficient, take the most direct route I could. And so open wheel was the, the series that I settled on. Um, but doing the Skip Barber series, I think was a great transition because I was racing with other kids and other drivers with similar experience level. You know, they were transitioning from carts to cars or they were just getting into it. And so having that, that sort of same baseline allowed me to kind of grow without the pressure of becoming a, a driver with, you know, all these drivers with all this experience kind of pouring over the top of me and kind of, uh, pushing me out of what could have been a, su a successful learning experience. Um, but as I transitioned up through Skip Barber, I began to see the different paths open up and we got into the road to Indy because that was the clearest path to IndyCar, um, through the junior rings. And looking at you've, done a lot of different like you said different cars nascars dirt cars uh, open wheels what's the car uh so far that you've been kind of most surprised with that's like kind of been the most difficult to kind of get to grip grips with probably the indy car honestly um you know i think that my initial impression with the indy car when I got to drive it last year uh, as part of the scholarship winner from my 2020 indy pro 2000 championship um was that it was very very similar and actually easier to drive than the indy next car since then my opinion has changed because there are so many variables that go into driving an indy car there's uh more tire deck more nuances as far as uh, different tire compounds etc and on different track surfaces that plays a big role and so for myself i think that um, the indy car has been the hardest to adapt to because there's so much that goes on around it that you almost can't can't focus on one thing at a time you got you got five things that you're juggling rather than just, okay, I need to break later. Okay, I need to turn in here. Okay, I need to hit the gas here. Um, the other series do a good job of allowing you to kind of think your way through that more than what IndyCar does. And now, uh, actually, let's go back to uh, IndyCar itself. Again, like the 500 was last week. Um, how physical is that race? Because I know it's an oval. I know it's, uh, some people will say it's like, oh, it's just turning left. But obviously, you're, a person that will definitely know how it is. How physical is that? The Indy 500 itself is not too bad. Um, the mental strain is high because you're doing stupid speeds for three plus hours. Yeah. And you're doing it with 32 other cars that are wanting to kill you around that place. And so um, there, there is a lot of mental strain, I think, that goes into that. So you have to pace yourself. Um, but physically, I think the hardest race that we've done so far is probably one of the street courses. Um, I think that, you know, tracks like St. Peter, Long Beach, they actually get rubbered in quite well <clears throat> during a racing stint. And so that means that the, the steering wheel is quite heavy to turn and without power steering, it makes it very, very difficult. And over the course of a, a race that's 95 or hundred laps that wears on you. And we're doing heart rates. Our heart rates are anywhere from 130 to 180 for an entire race stint. And that's a three hour stint. And so we're, we have to train like endurance athletes a lot of times to be able to be prepared for those situations where you're, you're going into a race and the, the track grip level comes up through the event. Um, Texas Motor Speed was actually surprising to me because as the new, new tires would go on the car and the full fuel load would come up, 
um, I'd go through turns three and four and almost not be able to turn the wheel. It's like everything I could just to turn the wheel of the car because there was so much downforce, so much grip. And with the banking, it uh, just adds weight to the wheel and the physicality is quite high. And uh, I was just talking about street courses. You were on Detroit uh, just two days ago, actually. Uh, obviously, new, brand new track. Uh, how was the conditions there of the track itself? Uh, the track itself was quite bumpy. And I think that that was a, a sort of a surprise for many drivers as we approach the, the weekend. Um, usually, you have a couple lanes that you can run down a straightaway. And it seemed like... If you got offline at all, you could have this, the chance of breaking a suspension piece or whatever else. And so for myself, I think that the, the track was a quite fun layout. Um, it was narrow at parts, but um, it, it could race well had the, the surfaces been a little bit better. Um, but I think it's a good thing that the series is trying to expand into the downtown area, uh, bring more fans out. Um, Bell Isle was a track that I loved because I'd gotten to swim in the fountain ahead of them uh, moving on to the downtown Detroit streets. Um, but yeah, I think the event as a whole, I, uh, yeah, it was, it was a first time event, a lot to learn, a lot to adjust and hopefully they'll get it figured out for next year. And that was a very, it's a very fast, uh, track. And then there was like 90, basically 90 degree corners through everywhere. Uh, how physical was that? Um, physically it's actually not too bad because the grip level was quite low. Um, when the grip level increases, the weight of the wheel increases, like I said, and also adds more g-load on the body but for detroit we we had such a low grip level so we didn't have a turn that was over 70 miles an hour and so that was quite interesting for a street course to have such low speed corners without any high speed mixed in and so for myself i think that that was probably the easiest race that we've had so far being in detroit other than you get the brain blender of all the bumps and everything else you know by the time that the, the race is done you feel like you got punched in the face a few times from your head being rattled around so much so that was probably the toughest part was the the bumps and bruises that come from Detroit, um, but physically, I think that the preparation is not as high as other tracks. <clears throat> and uh, what what so far has been kind of the the most like uh, physically straining circuit that you've been on this year? Yeah, I would probably say one of the street courses like St. Peter Long Beach, where the grub levels really really increase throughout the run. Um, that's when you feel the weight of the car more. Um, and so that, that was also when the track was the hottest, you know, I think when the conditions go above 90 or 95 degrees, there's no sort of air conditioning in the, in the cockpit and I don't run a cool suit. And so the heat gets to you just as much as the, the strain inside the cockpit. And, uh, obviously you've driven some of the, like the most legendary kind of tracks like Laguna Seca, um, Indiana, the both Indianapolis, the in, inside and the oval itself. What has been like your f favorite track uh, this year that you've driven on? Yeah, so I think in in the past I like track that tracks that I win on. Um, typical driver answer: tracks that you're successful at seem to have a better place in your heart than others. Um, I think so far this year, the track that I've enjoyed the most was probably Barber. Um, the race we we had cut short because of the mechanical failure there, but um, that was the first track that I really felt like an IndyCar driver at. And I said that just because um, I felt like it was a track that I knew. I felt like I knew the rhythm of the track. I knew what the car needed. Um, I was in the best place mentally. And so for myself, that was somewhere where I, I really enjoyed the circuit because of the different elevation changes, um, really high speed corners, uh, great passing zones. Um, and so I really like tracks that are permanent road courses with a lot of elevation change. And also, what I just want to, what's the like one of the big differences between like somewhere like Detroit, where it's a street circuit, and somewhere like uh, like Indianapolis, the inside of Indianapolis. What's the the biggest difference between those two circuits? Uh, track surface probably, and also the length of the track and the style of the corners. You know, when you look at a permanent road course. Many times they're not just straight away, 90 degree corner, straight away, 90 degree corner. It's more of a, okay, you have a curved break zone here and then it's some chicanes and uh, it just adds more of a dynamic element to it. Um, whereas street tracks, they're kind of limited to what the downtown streets are made of. And so for us, that means more bumps, uh, different aggregates, different asphalt and concrete throughout the, the lap and also bumps during an apex or an exit or a break zone and concrete barriers. You know, you're not dealing with runoff or curbs or anything like that. It's if you miss it by a couple inches, 
uh, you're breaking suspension and hitting the wall. Hmm. Also, I also want to ask because I know you're a decently tall guy, and um, yeah. obviously, like that uh, in someone like IndyCar, where like weight matters a lot. Because I know it was like Sean Galeo who was like, all my friends like go out to restaurants and they eat a lot, but then I can't eat all that much. How has like, like needing to cut like the weight down? How has that affected like your lifestyle and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, I eat as much as I can. Um, I don't have to worry about my weight. It's usually the other way around. We burn so many calories behind the wheel that it makes it easy to, to stay below a certain weight. And so for myself, I'm trying to gain weight more than I'm trying to lose it. Um, and, you know, I think that I'm, I'm a, I am a tall guy, but I'm like right at that edge of being too tall to have to start to compromise. Um, so I think that God gave me a good balance of, uh, of genetics there to, to be a race car driver. It's uh, Are there still things in IndyCar right now? Cause again, it's your rookie season that you need to get, uh, are you trying to, get more used to or is everything kind of you know starting to settle down yeah i think that i'm i'm trying to get used to everything still i'm still learning just as much you know this last weekend as i was at st pete even even probably more so because um when you're overwhelmed with different things in any car it's hard to kind of see through the, see the trees through the forest if you will um and so having that that sort of experience allows me to kind of see those trees and understand uh what the impact is of certain things throughout the series um so yeah i'm still learning a lot there's still things that i need to work on personally and um you know i think that the the main focus for the upcoming races are going to be qualifying better and finishing races i think since it's a little bit uh i want to actually go to some fan questions real quick uh if that's okay okay um yep. I asked on Discord. Thank you for the people who um, answered, but put it anonymously for some reason. Um, right. Who is your favorite IndyCar driver of all time? Oh, of all time? I would probably say Mario Andretti, uh, just because he has become more than just an IndyCar driver. He's kind of been the face of the series for a long time. And so it's kind of cool to see his passion still to this day. I mean, I hope to be the guy that's 80 years old, wheeling around the two-seater, and pushing it to the limits. And you drove, you drove for him in Indy Lights, right? Yeah, I drove for his son, Michael. Mm. That's, that's really cool. Like, how is, like, be, again, being, like, linked to that name, Andretti, that's incredible. <laughs> but, uh, all right, next one is, this is kind of similar. Uh, who is your favorite driver of all time in any motorsport? Uh, I'm going to change this answer and change it to Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna was the reason that I wanted to get into open wheel racing because I saw the Senna documentary when I was a kid. And uh, it really made me appreciate the speeds and the downforce and just the, the detail that goes into driving them. It's pretty cool. Uh, other than IndyCar, what is your favorite car that you've ever driven? Ooh. Um... That's tough. You know, what's funny is I, I always love to go back to go-karts because even though the, the speeds aren't the, as high, um, the pace of the lap is actually quicker. And so it's kind of have, it's kind of cool to have that sort of pace, uh, where you're, you're hustling a go-kart around and the, the speeds are lower. So you can kind of pitch it around, slide it, jump a curb. Um, and the racing is just always so great. I, I think that I'm going to quote Ayrton Senna on this, um, but go karting is the purest form of motorsports. I was just about to ask that. Is like, do you agree with that? Yeah. All right. Yes. Um, all right. What's your favorite track that you've ever driven in any category? Oh, that's tough. Um, Laguna Seca is definitely up there. I love that track because I have one on it now. And also the, the corkscrew is great. Lots of passing zones. It's got good curbs and good width, and um, it just it makes the racing pretty good, I think, there. I also really enjoyed the National Corvette Museum track. For anyone that hasn't been, um, it's kind of got its own version of the corkscrew. It's, they've got sinkholes there, and those sinkholes add a lot of elevation change to the track that you might not get otherwise. And it's very unique because it's more of a bowl than it is just a drop-off. And uh, I got to race that in the Skip Barber Series 
in the rain. And so I, I, I really enjoyed it in the rain because there was many different lines you could do. The curbs were proper, so you could drive it like a go-kart and jump the curbs and slide it around. And um, it was just unique compared to other tracks. Uh, just two more, I think. All right. Um, yeah. What's uh, your best fan experience in a racetrack? Best fan experience? Yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind is there was a kid once uh, who was asking me for an autograph, and he asked me to sign his forehead. And he had a blue Sharpie ready for me, and he had a blue Gatorade mustache as well. And so I was like, okay. And I saw his mom there, and she said, he wants it. So I said, all right. So I signed his forehead in blue Sharpie, and it matched perfectly the Gatorade mustache that he had. Oh, my God. Oh, God. I... <laughs> That blue Gatorade mustache, that's something I know too, almost too well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. great. Um, favorite country you've ever visited? Oh, shoot. Oh, uh, man. The first thing that popped in my head was like four different countries, so that doesn't help. Um, <laughs> Italy's got a special place in my heart because the food there is incredible. I love the food in Italy. Um it is quite busy where we were when I was visiting, but I did like where we stayed. And one of the cool things about Italy is that the people are quite friendly there. They're not standoffish. They, they were very welcoming. And I was driving for a team that uh, I kind of had some inside scoop with. And so they were like our local tour guides, which was awesome. Belgium was probably the coolest historically because they still have a lot of their, uh, the guilds. They also had uh the bruges and where else were we in, in belgium i mean just like a lot of cool historic places you know you're dealing with old buildings that were they had a, a battle at a church in like the 1400s and there's still a cannonball stuck in the pillar from that battle it's like america wasn't even around at that point and there's a cannonball from then that's pretty cool um switzerland was the most beautiful natural terrain um with the swiss alps and everything else there um spain and portugal i love the coast there and i like that it wasn't super populated where we were it was nice to kind of just like have the open countryside and farmlands and just like great food absolutely amazing food so if i had to pick one out of all of those to go back and visit right now i would probably say spain, spain. but that could change that could change <laughs> <laughs> all right this is the last one um other than IndyCar, what is a racing category that you watch the most? Uh, Formula One, for sure. There was also, I, I, I love I love the touring car championships, especially with the new prototype cars. To see the hyper cars, uh, I, I would love to drive one of those. To do Le Mans or the Rolex 24 hour or Sebring 12 hour, something like that. I think that that's a bucket list item for me. Hmm. Actually, was that's, I was about to ask that. Um, other than like IndyCar and obviously like you just said Daytona, um, what's something that you would like to drive in the future? Yeah, so those things obviously. Um, I also would really like to do a rally car race at some point, and also the Baja One Thousand. I've had a couple of offers to do the Baja One Thousand, it just hasn't come together yet. So hopefully, one of these days I'll be able to check that off. I just love the idea of being in a truck just flat out through the desert for a thousand miles. I think that'd be so cool. All right, I ask you one more question before I, I let you go. Um, what advice do you have for someone uh, who would want to get into IndyCar or uh, is trying to just to get into racing in general? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what stage of life you're in. If you're uh, limited on time and you've got a full-time job, I think the best option um, to be able to enjoy racing at its most pure aspect, I'm going to quote Aaron Sunday yet again, but go-karting is the purest form of motorsport. So find a local go-kart track, get into a series where you can be competitive and race with their drivers, and then you don't have to spend a lot of money to do it. Um, for us locally in Idaho, we have a, a track that does LO206 racing, and it's great because tire compound doesn't really matter. You can have old tires, you can have new tires, you're still going to be able to race. Um, the engines are fairly equal, and it's fairly cheap. And so the barrier of entry is fairly low. Um, but if you want to get into car racing, there's some great car series out there, Skip Barber being one of them, like I started in. The Bondurant Driving School, um, Perump, I've heard good things about. The Thermal Club, which is the track that we went testing at this year. Um, there's also the Lucas Oil Racing Series. 
And so that can kind of get your feet wet into motorsports at a low barrier entry, low uh, cost point, and also with a, a similar experience level to the other drivers around you. You know, you're not going to be dealing with drivers that are absolutely brand new and have no idea what they're doing. They might still be a little bit of that, but um, you're you're going to be able to have that that knowledge and experience coming from the coaches and they're going to understand where you're at. And uh, that's different than going with an indie car driver and just getting your butt whooped. That's going to be more discouraging than it would be if you start at a level and you're competitive and you kind of work your way up. Um, so if, you, if you're anywhere in the world, I would say get into go-karting first and then go check out a, a local racing school. Well, that's about all we have for today. Uh, Stingray, thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Wheel. Um, I, obviously, wherever it goes from here, I, I will be rooting for you. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you everyone for watching. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye. Well, that, I think, was a very special episode of Behind the Wheel. Thank you so much to Stingray Rob and his team for making this actually happen, and I hope you guys really enjoyed that. Join us in a few weeks' time for more interviews. I'll see you all then. Bye-bye.